fourth generation nuclear weapons are, at the time of making this video, a pure theoretical possibility. But what is that theory? The idea is that such weapons would produce considerably less radioactive byproducts than current designs of nuclear weapons, but in turn, they would release a huge number of neutrons. The big question is, should we allow such weapon designs to go ahead, and how scared should we be if we do, and how scared should we be if we don't? To best deduce answers to all these questions, we first need to understand what first, second, and third generation nuclear weapons are. But before that, here are two words you are going to hear a lot over the course of the next 10 minutes. Fusion and Fission To better understand the nature of explosions, you need to understand those two words. Fusion is the process or result of joining two or more things together to form a single entity. Well, fission is defined as division or splitting into two or more parts. That makes fusion and fission very different processes, yet both are vital to the history of the bomb. With that in mind, let's explore the terrifying history of the first three generations of nuclear weapons. The first-gen nukes are called pure fission weapons because they are all about fission. PFWs are the simplest and least technically demanding of all nuclear weapons to design and build. Though they are the oldest design and the most simplistic, they are the only style to ever have been actively used in an act of war. The United States Army Air Force infamously dropped a fission nuclear bomb onto the city of Hiroshima at 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945. The effects were horrific and devastating. Most of the city was destroyed and, by the end of the year, an estimated 90 to 166,000 had perished as a result of the blast and its effects. It remains one of the most infamous events in the history of human war and one of the few times a nuclear weapon has been actively used. But how do these bombs actually work? The process is known as nuclear fission, as we know from the second of those words that means some kind of splitting or division is involved. A neutron is fired at the nucleus of a heavy element, such as uranium. The impact causes the atom to split into two lighter elements. This, in turn, releases a colossal amount of energy, in various forms. 80% of the energy released takes the form of soft X-rays. The remaining 20% is neutrons and other particles. It's the X-rays you need to be worried about. Once those hit the atmosphere, they turn into extreme heat thus producing the epic shock wave that we could refer to as the explosion. This is the style of bomb that devastated both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the ethics of their use is still hotly debated all these years later. Despite the horrifying things pure fission weapons prove themselves to be capable of, development continued on the next stage of warfare. Second generation nuclear weapons are called boosted fission weapons, and as you can probably tell from the name, they take the already terrifying fission weapons and give them an extra boost. A boosted fission device uses trace amounts of deuterium and tritium to ignite a small-scale fusion reaction at the exact moment the traditional fission chain reaction begins. As such, the reaction is greatly enhanced. The primary benefit of using a boosted fission weapon over a pure fission weapon is that a boosted fission weapon produces a great many neutrons far more than could normally be generated by a standard fission initiator. This intensity of this neutron bombardment means far more of the bomb's core undergoes fission reactions before the explosion ultimately tears the bomb apart. Because of this, a boosted fission weapon has a greatly increased yield compared to a pure fission weapon, sometimes even double. You would think this was enough for the warmongers of mankind, but no they choose to dream even bigger. From here, they developed a third generation of nuclear weapons, otherwise known as thermonuclear weapons. They have also been referred to as hydrogen bombs or H-bombs, as they rely heavily on fusion reaction between deuterium and tritium, which are both isotopes of hydrogen. H-bombs work by using the energy of a fission bomb to compress and heat fusion fuel. This increases the rate, and therefore, yield, of a fission reaction. 
The neutrons released by the fusion's reactions add to the neutrons released due to fission. This allows for even more neutron-induced fission reactions to occur. The rate of fission is thereby greatly increased. Essentially, they do the opposite of a first-generation nuclear weapon. Instead of a heavy element being split in half, two smaller elements are forced together to make a singular heavy element. This is possible because there is an incredibly strong nuclear force. Protons have a positive charge, meaning that ordinarily they would repel each other. But this strong force pushes them together. The uniqueness of thermonuclear bombs is that they operate in two separate stages. The first stage is identical to a second-generation bomb and is known as the primary. But while in a second-generation nuclear weapon, this would be the entire explosion. In a third-generation bomb, this is merely a trigger for the second stage. Both primary and secondary bombs are contained within an outer metal case. Radiation from the fission explosion of the primary is contained and used to transfer energy to compress and ignite the secondary. Some of the initial radiation from the primary explosion is absorbed by the inner surface of the case, which is made of a high-density material, such as uranium. Though such a bomb has never been used in battle, the first full-scale test of a third-generation nuclear weapon was carried out by the United States back in 1952. Shaped more like a factory than a traditional bomb, it was named Ivy Mike, and a test explosion took place at 7.15 p.m. on, of all dates, October 31st, Halloween. What happened during the Ivy Mike test is a good indicator of the devastation the use of such a nuclear weapon could cause. The test produced a yield of 10.4 megatons of TNT, and the fireball created by the explosion had a maximum radius of 1.8 to 2.1 miles. The intensity of the blast created a crater that was 6,230 feet in diameter and 164 feet deep. In a mere 90 seconds, the mushroom cloud grew to an altitude of 56,000 feet. To give that some perspective, the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, is only 2,717 feet. And the cloud didn't stop there. Within just one more minute, it had reached 108,000 feet, and it still kept going. It ultimately stabilized at a monstrous 135,000 feet. The blast also triggered water waves, some as high as 20 feet, and those combined with the force of the blast stripped the island on which the experiment was conducted clean of all vegetation. This was all just a test. This was nothing but a demonstration of what a third-generation nuclear weapon could do. Thankfully, one has never been used in actual warfare. Yet. But still, people dream and work towards the next stage of theoretical nuclear weaponry. Of theoretical nuclear weaponry. And that brings us to the promise of the fourth generation. And what is that? In short, the fourth generation is the total antithesis of the first generation. Known as a pure fusion weapon, the fourth generation is a hypothetical hydrogen bomb that does not need a fission primary explosive to ignite the fusion of deuterium and tritium, like in the aforementioned thermonuclear weapons. For many years now, designers of such weapons have been researching whether it is possible to trigger the high pressure and temperature required to ignite a fusion reaction without using fission at all. The secondary stage of a thermonuclear bomb without the primary. The main reason weapon developers want to create such a device is that it would require no fissile material and would, therefore, be much easier to develop in secret than the standard thermonuclear weapons. But pure fusion weapons offer an interesting possibility beyond just the ability to make them in secret. They could generate arbitrarily small nuclear yields because no critical mass of fissile fuel needs to be assembled for detonation, as with a conventional fission primary. This would mean a significant decrease in collateral damage from fallout, because a fourth-generation nuclear weapon would not create the same radioactive byproducts associated with the other three generations. If fission can be removed from the nuclear weapons completely, we would have a weapon with the initial impact of a thermonuclear weapon but without the horrifying radioactive fallout that traditionally follows. Such a nuclear weapon can be thought of, but can it be built? 
Following the Ivy Mike test, the U.S. spent 40 years and millions of dollars trying to produce a pure fusion weapon. Despite this, no significant advances were made. The key to the successful development of a pure fusion weapon is finding an alternative trigger. One avenue explored by researchers is antimatter. Such a device, in a weapons context, would have all of the desired properties of a pure fusion weapon. But there are significant technical barriers to both producing and containing the required quantities of antimatter. Though the theory holds up, the reality is well beyond present capabilities. Other fission-free theories for triggers include inducing gamma emission and very high energy density chemicals, such as ballotechnics. The gamma theory hinges on the use of nuclear isomers. For those unfamiliar, this is a metastable state of atomic nucleus in which one or more nucleons occupy significantly higher energy levels than in the ground state of the same nucleus. Isomers of the elements hafnium and tantalum can be induced to create incredibly strong gamma radiation. Emission of gamma from hafnium or tantalum isomers may just have enough energy to trigger a thermonuclear reaction without fission material such as deuterium or tritium. But as of right now, it is still nothing but one of the many theories as how to do it. In humanity's quest to develop the perfect nuclear weapon, we began with pure fission, brought fusion into the mix, and are now on the quest to remove the fission and go full fusion. Do you think it's possible? And if so, is it even a worthwhile pursuit? Let us know in the comment section below, and if you like the video, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll be the first to know when a new video arrives. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.